I want to discuss a seminal paper, what I think is a seminal paper um, of yours that you published back in 2004. Mm -hmm. You co-published with Dr. Von Shackey mm -hmm. about the omega-3 index and the omega-3 index being an important risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Right. Can you explain to people <clears throat> what the omega-3 index is and let's get into why you thought and think it's a risk factor for cardiovascular sure. disease. Sure, yeah, that's yeah, great. Um, just a little background on how Dr. Von Shackey and I came up with this idea is we were together at, in 2002 at, in Chicago at American Heart Association meeting. And Dr. Christine Albert from uh, Harvard had just presented her study where she'd looked at blood omega-3 levels in uh, the physician's health study. And they had stored blood from when they recruited the men into this physician's health study. It was an observational study. And they had uh, frozen blood samples uh, and they, after 17 years, they looked back and saw that they had a certain number of sudden cardiac death events in the physician's health study. And so the theory had already been out there from 10 years earlier that a high omega-3 would protect against sudden cardiac arrests. This is from animal studies um, and some human stuff. So the physician's health study said, well, let's go look at the blood that's in the freezer of these guys who died of sudden cardiac arrest and compared to some controls who didn't die, you know, just case control study. And they analyzed the blood and they found that those men who had the highest omega-3 levels at baseline when they started um, were like 90% less likely to be a case, experience sudden cardiac arrest and sudden cardiac death. So Clemens and I were sitting after this talk having a beer, talking about it. And we said, look, this is, the omega-3 level in the blood means something. I mean, it really does predict. I mean, this is the second study that had shown it. Uh, but this is the first one that had been prospective. It really is just like a risk factor, like cholesterol is, except this is one that you can modify easily and without taking drugs, without going on extreme diets, without having to change your lifestyle completely. You can just eat more fish or take supplements and you can raise your omega-3 levels and reduce risk. So he said, we said there ought to be, a, doctors ought to be able to know their patient's omega-3 level so they can do something about it. If you don't measure it, you can't control it, right? Manage it. So we kind of said, well, we ought to make up a test. We ought to, you know, both knew, we both had laboratories so we could say, well, we can do this. So he, Ultimately, we, over the next two years, wrote this paper, brought the evidence together and explained why we think and what we thought a target omega-3 level ought to be. And we called it the omega-3 index. We didn't really know what to call it. Didn't want to call it red blood cell on EPA plus DHA. It's too much. And we picked red blood cells because that had been used in past studies. And it makes sense because it's a long-term marker of omega-3 status because the omega-3s are in the membrane of the red cell and in most other tissues in the body, all other tissues. Um, so it was a good reflection of other tissues. And so we, again, wrote this paper, published it in Preventive Medicine in 2004 and said, here's the omega-3 index. It ought to be, people ought to start looking at this like a risk factor. And that's kind of what's happened. It's, it's slowly, I mean, this is now, what, 17 years later. It's not certainly recognized by the American Heart Association or the NIH or anybody as an official risk factor, but I hopefully someday it will be. In the same sense that CRP took a long time to be kind of considered a risk factor. Um, Omega-3, I think, definitely deserves it for a variety of, not just heart disease, for a variety of reasons. But that, that was the genesis of it. He started a laboratory in Munich called Omega Metrics, which is still going, which, and we started a laboratory in the U.S. called Omega Quant. We use identical methods. So, and this this is a big problem with just the the diagnostic field. Is what's the method you're using? Because you get a different answer for different methods. So that's a problem. Standardizing it's a problem. Um, but he and I both started doing studies independently of each other, exploring the omega three index as a risk factor. And it's I think the evidence has grown quite well. What's the, what's the biggest difference between measuring 
EPA and DHA in red blood cells, the omega-3 index, versus you mentioned they're, you know, they're in the membranes of the, yeah. of the cell, which is you know, indicative of many things, and it's also long-term. Um, but most of the time, if people are going to go get omega-3, most people don't make, ever get their omega-3 right, right. It's very rare. But, very rare. But if they do, they often get plasma omega-3 or phospholipid omega-3. Right. What are your thoughts on the differences there? In, in there are differences. Uh, first of all, in plasma, of course, there are lipoproteins. The, all the lipids in plasma are in lipoproteins, and lipoproteins have a membrane, and that membrane has got fatty acids in it. Um, lipoproteins also contain triglycerides and cholesterol esters, which also have fatty acids attached to different patterns of fatty acids. So the plasma has certainly has omega-3, and you can express the plasma omega-3 content as a percent of total plasma fatty acids. It's just that the number you get, like a normal might be 2% for plasma EPA DHA, whereas for red blood cell EPA DHA, which is just the red cell membrane, it might be 5 or 6% would be normal. So numerically, the values are different. They correlate pretty well. So if you, just, if you put them on an XY graph, the plasma level and the red cell level, you get a pretty good correlation. Um, but it's, what's confusing about it is the number is different. It's, it's like saying you're, if you don't have the same units, you don't have the same, uh, you, you don't really know how to set a target if people are talking about different numbers in different, in different lipid pools. Um, one problem that I have with the plasma is it's just more noisy. Day to day, it varies. <clears throat> Because, especially if you're in a, in a, uh, a non-fasting state, if you're just eating, you've got now triglycerides come with fatty acids coming into the blood, changing the denominator, because it's a percent of total fatty acids. And if you are just had a big meal, that's going to change your plasma percent EPA, uh, where it won't affect your red blood cell. So red blood cell is, is very much like a hemoglobin A1C relative to a plasma glucose. It, it's the same concept. It's a more stable long-term marker. It's not, not affected by daily fluctuations, whereas plasma levels are. So that's one thing I don't like about plasma. Plus, very few studies have really used plasma. It's hard to know what the target omega-3 level would be in plasma. Um, do you think the omega-3 index is indicative of <laughs> EPA and DHA levels in every different organ, including the brain, or is there... Some... Well, yeah, you, you, you hit it. Uh, almost every organ, probably but the brain. Um, the brain is, is, there's this blood-brain barrier, of course, which, which is very careful to take in what it wants. The uh, brain has got a huge amount of DHA, almost no EPA in, in brain tissue. I mean, obviously, in the blood flowing through the brain, it's there, but um, yeah, the the correlation between the red blood cell and brain tissue is not nearly as good in brain as it is in heart, liver, muscle, every other internal organ uh, where the red cell does reflect much better. Uh, numerically, maybe a different value for red cell versus liver, but the correlation would be very good. The higher the omega-3 in the, in the red cell, the higher the level in the liver. Uh, but it may not be the same number, the same percent. Do you think the the red blood cell omega three the omega three index is better indicator of brain than plasma? I think I. Well, probably yeah, probably better than plasma, um, but uh, and I think you just have to tra part of the brain just turns over so slow. You know, red cells turn over in 120 days. Brains I, I don't know off the top of my head how fast brain cells turn over uh, and are resynthesized, um, but I suspect it's quite a bit longer turnover time is much longer. So you've, you've measured omega-3 index in, I mean, just many, many people through yeah, yeah, publications right. and omega quant, which people can then, you know, go and, and get their omega, th mm -hmm. omega index um, quantified. Do you see, are there like huge variations in people that are given or, or have the um, relative like average amount of dietary intake of omega-3 is similar? Do you see that there's still variations in the omega-3 index. Yeah, right, and, and this is something we, we don't understand yet. Um, there is quite a bit of 
background variability. Uh, and it, we always say genetic. Well, you know, what else are you going to say? Um, even though we know that there's, we, we have not discovered, uh, we scientific group have no, not discovered any genes that really control EPA DHA levels well, like the, the standard fatty acid desaturase, FADS gene, have very little effect. But mutations in that gene have very little effect on omega. They affect omega-6, arachidonic acid levels, pretty substantially, those mutations in fatty acid desaturase. But they don't affect the omega-3s very much at all. Two or three percent variability explained by that. So we don't know what it is. Um, a, a probably an even bigger variability is the variability uh, in response to taking an omega-3. So we look at the delta, the change in omega-3 index at different with different dosage groups, and it can be, you know, the, on average, it's a very nice, the higher the dose, the higher the omega-3 index. But if you look at the individual splay ac across those increases, some people will, on the on a 1,800 milligrams of EPA DHA, they might go up from an omega-3 index of 4 to 4.3. Others might go up from 4 to 8. I mean, it's just huge variability, and we don't, we don't think it's compliance all the time. I think there's some actual, just a lot of, a, a, a lot of land to cover between your mouth and your blood. Omega-3 is probably the easiest, one of the easiest nutrients to study like a drug of all the nutrients because our background intake is so little. And th there's so little metabolism, in vivo metabolism of uh, um, omega-3. It's not controlled like calcium levels are controlled so tightly. Magnesium levels in the blood are controlled tightly. Glucose is pretty tightly controlled. Yeah, I mean, but omega-3 is not very tightly controlled. It's driven by diet. How much do you eat? Um, so it's, it's the reason that omega-3 has been probably like the fifth most studied molecule in medicine uh, is because it's been easy to study in, in the drug model. You know, right. Plus it works. It, so you, you said something that kind of piqued my interest about it, you know, not being tightly regulated because, you know, it's controlled by your diet. Is there like an upper, like, upper, uh, in, like an upper level to the omega-3 index? Can you saturate that? Like if you I think so. eat nothing but fish? <laughs> yeah, well, or eat 25 grams a day. Right. Um, which, in that study, we don't know what the red salt was. We didn't measure them. We just did plasma. But yeah, in our experience at Omega Quant, and we're looking at thousands of, of, of dried blood spot tests for omega-3, getting up above more than 15, 16%. So, context, right? Average Americans, roughly 5% omega-3 index, which is EPA and DHA in red cells as a percent of the total fatty acids in the red cells. So 5% of the fatty acids in the red cell membrane are EPA and DHA. Japan, it's on average 9%, 8, 9, 10%, because they eat so much more omega-3 than we do. Um, vegans are down around 3.5%, as are U.S. military personnel, I'm sorry to say, when we've studied the soldiers, that's about the same as a vegan, and you know they're not vegans. Um, so they're not getting enough omega-3. So... 4%, we, we, we like to say be over 8%. That's the goal. That's been our target. So you can get up to about 15 or 16%. We have seen two or three people out of hundreds of thousands that are over 20%. Wow. Which is weird. But, that, but that's, I mean, a, a dolphin here at, at SeaWorld, which we studied, and that's all they eat is fish, right? And they weigh about 200 kilograms. I mean, they're big mammals like us, and they all they eat is fish, their omega-3 index is around 18 or 19%. So that's, I think that's about as all that you can get into a, a cell membrane. Wow. It's only so much, the body will only let you put so much, because when red cells are made, they're made to be able to perform a function. And the fluidity of the membrane is very important. And I'm, somehow or another, bone marrow knows how much polyunsaturated fat can go into that membrane. And it just is enough. So you very recently published a study that 
correlated the omega-3 index to all-cause mortality. Right. It was able to even predict uh, mortality. Right. Very, very interesting study. Um, I shared it on social media, but I would love to talk about oh. it. Yeah, yeah, sure. That was a... It's going to be probably one of my capstone studies, I think, and in, in hindsight. Um, it was a, a collaboration among 17 different cohorts, like, like the Framingham study is a cohort, Women's Health Initiative is a cohort, MESA, EPIC. These are all, uh, and from all around the world, these are groups that have been uh, recruited at one point in time, blood samples taken, uh, fatty acid levels measured in that blood, and then the investigators just follow this group of people over time to see what happens, what kind of diseases they get, you know, who gets, who dies, who doesn't. And so we had 17 of those pooled together and around 40, 45,000 people all together uh, where we had omega-3 levels at the beginning and then roughly um, the total follow-up time when you're, when you're looking at risk for death, all-cause mortality, uh, you obviously look in a given window of time if you wait long enough, it's 100%. Everybody dies. So you can't wait forever. You got to wait. So, so we, we looked uh, basically between age 65 and 75. Who, who, who died in that window of time? And we found that the people that had the highest omega-3 levels compared to the lowest were 15% or so less likely to die over that time. And it was a very, when you look at quintiles of omega-3, it was very dose-dependent. The higher the omega-3, the lower the risk. Uh, and that was for total mortality. Um, we then looked at cardiovascular mortality, cancer mortality, and then everything else. Kitchen sink. You know, if it's not cancer, not cardiovascular, it's group three. Uh, and we saw the same thing in all group. It wasn't as strong in cancer. It wasn't as stair-steppy um, like it was in cardiovascular. Um, but the highest group in omega-3s uh, did have a significantly lower risk of death from cancer. Uh, but it, interesting to me is the non-cardiovascular, non-cancer, all these other causes of death from electrocution to suicide to car accidents to kidney failure, you know, everything people die of. Um, the higher the omega-3, just like cardiovascular, do, 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 lower risk. So there's something very systemic, very protective ac across many health and many systems in the body. Many diseases, I think, are just held somewhat in check by having a higher omega-3. It's not just heart disease. I think that's the message to get out. It's not just heart disease. Right. Um, and this 15% decrease in all-cause mortality, was that about a five-year? Was it translated to about a five? We didn't. In that study, we didn't try to get at that because uh, basically that meant if in that window of time, you were 15% less likely to die. Okay. How long you actually lived, we, don't, we didn't follow people until they died all the time. Um, but in the f another study we published from Framingham, just one cohort, uh, we did see that there's roughly uh, a five-year difference. If you're at the very lowest omega-3 versus the highest, your, your odds of dying are about five years earlier. Can you say again, so the omega-3 index for the lowest was? Was that probably under, uh, under 4%? And it's for the upper level, roughly 7%. And this is, again, this is observational in framing, and nobody's supplementing. So we haven't got people, many people, over 8%. This is, you know, people living in Boston. And so they don't have high omega 3 levels. But the highest quartile, quintile, was about over 7, over 6, over 7%. You said the average in the United States was about 5. Uh, 5 ish. So 5 ish. And What's the average intake of fish in the, US, in the United States? Fish, well, what is it, 13 pounds per person per year. Um, and that's all fish. All and all, it, right, so that includes, you know, uh, shrimp, which has zero <laughs> omega-3, and, and uh, white fish, pollock, which is the fried fish that people get at McDonald's, and uh, salmon itself, which is the, one of the highest omega-3 fish, certainly the most, one of the highest that people actually eat. Um, you know, that's, that provides about one and a half grams per serving of omega-3. 
Uh, the average intake of EPA and DHA in America is something of 100 to 100, 150 milligrams a day. The median intake is zero. Okay. The average, because some people eat a lot and a whole lot of people eat none. Wow. You know, so the median is zero, at least to two decimal places. And, but the average intake is 100, say 120 milligrams a day. In Japan, it's roughly 900 milligrams a day. 900 milligrams. And I'll, for life, for minus nine months. Wow. There are, I mean, because moms do yeah. it too, yeah. And they're, they, if I remember correctly, their average lifespan is about five years longer than the United States average. Right, right? despite the fact they smoke more, despite the fact they have more hypertension, despite the fact they have higher stress life, they still live four or five years longer. Does omega-3, is it known that if it has any effect Effect on smoking in terms of like negating some of the negative? Well, that's in our most recent paper in Framingham, we asked the question. Um, we're, we're, in general, we're trying to, to understand how much of a risk factor is omega 3 compared to things you already know for, for death. So we, we know cholesterol is a risk factor, we know blood pressure is a risk factor, we know diabetes is having diabetes. We know being a smoker is a risk factor for bad outcomes. So how does omega-3 compare to that? Um, and we found that in the study we did in Framingham, looking at all-cause mortality, that uh, if you're a smoker and you have a low omega-3, you, you're 50, you know, over the 10 years of the study, you're 50-50 chance of living. You're gonna die a 50% chance of dying. If you have a low omega-3 and you're non-smoker, it's not so bad. Your, your risk of death maybe is 30% over that. Um, if you're a smoker and you have a high omega-3, that's the other flip side, but you're a smoker, your risk is kind of like having a low omega-3 and being a non-smoker. And then if you've, best case, you don't smoke and you have a high omega-3, your odds of dying are like 10%. So it's, in a way, having a low omega-3 is like being a smoker from a, but I don't mean to say that taking omega-3 erases your risk of being a smoker. Don't want people to think you can do that. <laughs> oh, oh, keep smoking, I just take some fish oil, it's, I'm good. That's not, not the deal. We, we do know this, that smoking actually lowers the omega-3 index. Smokers have lower omega-3 index than non-smokers from other studies. And it could be because of the uh, hyper oxidative state of a smoker's blood that could actually destroy omega-3s potentially. Right. Or they just don't eat fish oil, or they don't eat fish. That's the other explanation. Um, so the, the general uh, tack of both of our, the, our study in nature communications on total mortality with our 17 cohorts and this latest one in uh, American Journal of Clinical Nutrition in Framingham, uh, point to having a high omega-3 level is protective in, in the same sense that uh, having a low cholesterol is protective, in the same sense that having low blood pressure is protective. It's about the same predictive wow. value. And that's is, about 8% of omega-3 index around yeah, that's Yeah, again, if it's over seven in, in over Framingham, seven. Um, but in the the pool analysis of those 17 cohorts, it was roughly about 7.8%. The highest quintile was about roughly about the 8% target. So we, we felt uh, that our original 2004 idea that 8% would be the target, which was based on much less data back then, um, has been vindicated. It continues to be vindicated. It's been seen that that 8%, it's not, it's not perfect. I mean, in Japan, you might, you actually get a additional re redux re reduction in risk at 10% versus being at 8%. Okay, that's that's good, but we're now going from this much risk to this much risk. Yeah. You know. Well, that was going to be my question too. Is yeah. like, what do we? What if we get up into a you know 10 to 12 to 13 percent omega index? Is that even greater? It, I mean, it, it could be. Um, we at Omega Quant, we, we kind of say our target level is eight, or eight to 12. And it's not because above 12 is bad, it's because we just have so little data to know, to, to, to say that if you get to 14, you're better than you're at 12, or to even to say that you're 12, you're better than 10. 
We don't really know that. It's just a reasonable target level. Um, it's, it's safe. I'm not concerned about that. So, and it's tough enough for people just to get up to eight, never mind get up to 12. Uh, and so we, we're not um, trying to say anything above eight. As far as you can go, the higher the better. I, I don't know, I can't say that. I mean, there may be adverse effects that pop up somewhere out there. You would think, in theory, there could be. We just haven't seen them, but that doesn't mean they're not there. Hmm. So be conservative and just... Have you looked at the correlation of the omega-3 index with um, inflammatory biomarkers? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And as you expect, we, again, we did this in Framingham. We looked at uh, 10 different, very different inflammatory biomarkers uh, that in the plasma in patients in Framingham and correlated it with the omega-3 index and all 10 of them. The higher the omega-3, the lower the marker. So it's just across the board. It isn't just, you know, CRP. Uh, there's also some... Uh, <clears throat> uh, phospholipase A2, um, uh, mm. PLA2, mm -hmm. you know, PPLA2, that's the one, uh, which is kind of an inflammatory marker as well, very different. It's a very different chemical than CRP. Um, some bone related inflammatory markers were reduced uh, in association with omega 3. So it's For there. And, and giving omega 3 does lower inflammatory levels. So you also had a recent study um, kind of going back to the, the, the resolving of the inflammation um, aspect, what I think is very relevant in, you know, our, our 2021 world that we live in. <laughs> COVID world. <laughs> oh, yes, the COVID <laughs> world, um, where we have a, a, a pathogen that is um, in some people causing a very bad cascade of inflammation. Right. Um, so you published a study looking at the omega-3 index. Right. And COVID-19 associated mortality. Right. Right. We did that with uh, colleagues here in L.A. I don't know which way I'm pointing. Yeah. But. I probably should have said the pilot preprint hasn't actually, has it been peer-reviewed? It's not been peer-reviewed? Oh, no. It's it, peer-reviewed and published, published, no? okay. published in January. Published in January. Yeah, and it, it was a pilot study because we only had access to data from 100 people, um, which was too bad, but we did have omega-3 index levels in 100 people that have been admitted to Cedars-Sinai in LA with uh, COVID. <clears throat> and so we asked the question, well, you know, is there any relationship between how they did, did they live or die, and their omega-3 level? And it, it turned out if we looked, and again, the distribution of omega-3 levels was very narrow. It, it, you know, like, I think it probably went from... Uh, a low of three to a high of five, something like that. You know, it, but the distribution was was narrow, so we didn't be, weren't able to see. You know, oh, the people that had an eight percent didn't really. Nobody there in the study had an eight percent. <laughs> so, we we looked at the people who had the highest quartile of omega three levels, the twenty five percent highest compared to everybody else who was lower, and those people uh, were really. Uh, half as likely to die as people who had, but, and it was 0.07 p-value, so it wasn't statistically significant by standard metrics, but in the race to understand what we can do about COVID, we'll put up with a slightly non-significant strong trend in the right direction with good biology behind it to explain it. Um, another paper's come out from Chile, it's just confirming the same thing. They saw the same thing. Okay. What about um, Japan? Do you know what their because they're because their omega three index is higher? Yeah, I know. Do you know their mortality? I know a group um, has looked at this worldwide, and they looked at uh, WHO data on COVID death, and they looked at reported fish intake on in the countries, and they did it by six different regions around the world, and what they 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 showed you know the the higher the, the average fish intake, the lower the risk of death from COVID. Okay, it's hard to, hard to know so it's many variables right, there. Right, of course. <laughs> uh, but just, it, it, it sings the right song. Um, what that paper, that specific paper, was most, most interesting to me about was not this worldwide population thing, which was just their introduction. Their, I, they were doing in silico experiments looking at the, the spike protein on COVID 
and they found that there's two confirmations, an open and a closed confirmation. And um, if it's open, then it can interact with the receptor. H2 receptor, yeah. If it's closed, it can't. Right. If you got high, they found that DHA, again, in silico experiments, if it's present, will hold that thing in a closed position. So what is your personal omega-3 intake look like? Um, two to three grams a day from supplements. Um, I don't really have a favorite supplement. I kind of, maybe like your friend in Norway, I, I, if people send me supplements, oh yeah, try this. Um, and then salmon, I, probably once a week for sure. Try to do more, but at least once a week. Uh, so my index is around 10. Mine is a, the, in our, our lab, we have high controls and low controls for our assays. And so they're always getting my blood to do, for the high control. Um, so they want to have a 10%. They want to have a 3% um, when we do our assays at Omega Quant. And so it's, it's I've got to, I, because of that, I have to keep it up. Right. Uh, so I'm pretty diligent taking my Omega 3s. We're, uh, Working on a, on a paper right now, again, from uh, one of our cohorts, uh, looking at the omega-3 index predicting risk for Alzheimer's and dementia. And it does, which is nice. Um, and, but it's, that's kind of what you'd expect. Uh, we're looking for an interaction with APOE4 genotype and uh, not quite there. I think probably sample size is not. But it, it mm. generally, I mean, if we control for APOE levels, we find a still have a significant benefit of high omega-3 control for it. But if we stratify by APOE4, non-APOE4, uh, it looks like the benefit is a little better. The, the, the curve is steeper. The relationship is stronger in those that are at the higher risk, i.e. have E4, than in those that have low risk. Um, but I think because our sample size is too small at this point, can't get an official interaction P mm. value. So, so that it's actually uh, the, the preventative power is better in people who people are sicker, who are, who are, who are higher more risk, right? Higher risk, which is kind of um, what you guess. And this is this is a great work because you know a lot of the, the omega three brain or dementia or Alzheimer's disease research has always been fixing someone who already has it, trying to oh yeah right and you improve memory and I mean it's very hard to do very hard that to horse, do yeah that I mean horses out of the barn it is so. Um, if there are you know people that people do that do have a genetic risk for Alzheimer's disease, if they know that they can increase their omega three index by you know supplementing with omega three and mm -hmm. or and or increasing their you know uh, fatty fish like salmon or sardines that have high omega three in it to prevent and stave off dementia, I mean that would be it's very important and it's like low hanging fruit. It's, it's the, low hanging it's fruit. A you know, very safe way to help help reduce risk. Put it off for X years. We don't know how many years. Maybe you're putting off dementia. We'd like to try and figure that out.